it's funny, I had intended to um, go to the meeting that I had at four in this room so that I could get everything set up. I would have an hour, because I would just sign into the meeting and then put my picture. So I'd walk around and listen to it. And, uh, but there were people in my homework help hours until four. <laughs> So I didn't get a chance to come over here, so that's why I'm late. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's all good. All right. So, yeah, back to special relativity. Uh, with our eyes uh, focused on what's ahead, which is general relativity. So, um, I've been telling you some stories, and now I kind of want to summarize some of the results. Did you hit go? Did you hit? Yep. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to, at this point, stress to you the importance of the metric in a story. Because it turns out that until you specify the metric, things can look quite similar. So consider a four-dimensional space-time. And if you can't read what I'm writing because you're on the Zoom, you might download my notes and just try and follow in the notes because sometimes computer cameras aren't good enough to pick up handwriting on the board. Um, uh, with the coordinates C, T, X, Y, and Z uh, spanning space. And we know that relativity in general is defined by the laws of physics should be invariant under transformations lambda that satisfy lambda transpose times the metric of the space times lambda equals the metric of the space. Okay? Now here's three examples of this. First is if we take the metric to be eta. That is the metric of what we will call Minkowski space. This is the space-time of special relativity. And, oh, let me break out my cards. Because I gotta, gotta give my, what, should I shuffle these or should I just keep going in a cyclic order? What do you think? Live your truth. Say again? Live your truth. Live my truth? Yeah, whatever you're feeling for the day. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, well, they look like cards. I, this is the first time I've ever put card patterns on the back. So I think I'm going to try and shuffle them, but it's a really skinny deck. So it's kind of hard to shuffle. Anyway, I'll just give them the, the, the old ghetto shuffle. Okay, all right. So, Louie. Charles. Here. Charles. Uh, oh, there you are. So, oh, Charles Louie. Louie, uh, can you remind me what the components of the metric are for special relativity? What the eta components are? Uh, are you talking about uh, the negative one, 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 like in the diagonal? Yes, exactly. Okay? Please tell me you're now comfortable with the idea that if I write a matrix and I only put diagonal elements, all of the other elements are zero. I just get so tired of writing zero after a while, okay? I mean, almost zero. Okay, uh, no, I know. <laughs> how about big fat zeros? Do they work? I like yeah. that. Okay, fat zeros are good. Okay, anyway. So, um, <laughs> so in this case, and again, I'm giving you G, so you can take G, plug it in here, and then use that to figure out what the lambdas are. In this case, the lambdas include three rotations. and three boosts. Well, it's good to recall that the rotations utilize cosine and sine, whereas the boosts utilize the hyperbolics of these. And of course, the difference is that a rotation only uses two spatial axes, so the components of the metric have the both the same sign, whereas boosts use one spatial and one time, so there's a relative minus sign, and to clean things up, you use the identity between cosh and cinch to clear that up. Now, if you do this, then the story that emerges is that of special relativity. Which is defined on a space-time, 
which is four dimensional, and is called four dimensional Minkowski space, symbolized by that, M with that extra bar. Okay? If you don't know how to spell Minkowski, M I N K O W S K I. But now what I want to do is I just want to go through another example of a different relativity. That is, if we take G and we replace it with I, that is a diagonal matrix with all elements being I's, okay? We can play the same game and we can say physics doesn't care about transformations uh, associated with lambda which satisfy this expression with this G inserted. And I would love it if Eric Gomez, is Eric Gomez here? No. I didn't think he was. Um, Andrew. Andrew, what kind of, well, first of all, how many transformations do you think are going to be associated with this one? So we had six here. How many do you think are going to be associated with this one? Yeah, so, so <laughs> it's going to be six transformations, but what kind of transformations are they going to be? Rotations. They're all going to be rotations. Util utilizing cosine and sine. Okay? No boosts in this story because the metric is the same sign everywhere. Okay? What I'm trying to point out is just because, so by the way, let me say, it's purely spatial, I can use the exact same coordinate system, but the space in this case is R4, four-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, because R is the first letter of the word Euclidean. Yes? Can you clarify boosts? Boosts? Boosts are, there's two ways to think about them. One is it's a transformation which mixes a spatial direction with the time direction. And there's three of those. There's ZT, there's YT, and there's XT. So that's one way to think about it. But another way to think about it, which is what I finished the last lecture on, and you can show, and I showed that it corresponds to the same thing, is if I have a frame S, and this is the x-axis of the frame. These are other axes, but the motion's going to happen on x. Then I can boost to a second frame, S prime, which is moving with respect to the first frame. This is the effect of doing a transformation between the x and the t axis. Okay. So a boost is the difference between two states of motion. I'm boosting from being at rest in my frame to being a moving observer. Okay? And the connection between this rotation and the XT plane in this, you'll have to look at the notes from last time to kind of peel that apart. Okay. Um, so what I want to point out is just because we make this four-dimensional, it doesn't make it special relativity. You've got to have the right metric, OK? Now, I'm, I'm going to do a third example, which is by far the worst. Sorry, this one sucks. I'm going to start with a G1. And again, all of these are working in four dimensions with T, X, Y, Z. I'm going to start with G1, which is diagonal but only has a 1 in the first spot, and then I'm going to have a G2 twiddle, which is 0 in the first slot and 1's all the way down. Okay? Oh, wait a minute, I gave you two metrics. Ha -ha! Pretty confusing, isn't it? Well, it turns out that to get the transformations to preserve these, what we actually want to do is we want to find the lambda transpose that satisfies this. 
where this is the G twiddle. The one and two actually doesn't matter because I'm just doing G and G twiddle. Okay? And it turns out that this gives me, and this might be surprising, three rotations and three boosts. And it corresponds to a space which is a fiber bundle of R3 <coughs> over R1. Yeah? What's the fiber bundle? It's a really complicated mathematical construction, which is the geometrization of gauge symmetries, which helps you understand the electromagnetic geometry underpinning like the, the magnetic monopole structure and electromagnetism. It's a really complicated thing. However, does anybody know what this is? This is the first damn relativity you ever learned. This is Galilean relativity. I told you early on, Galilean space-time is sucky. This is way more beautiful, okay? Now remember, in Galilean relativity, you have this simple result for your velocity addition formula. Whereas in relativity, you have... So everybody sees this equation, they're like, that sucks, this is so much easier. Well, now this is a much simpler space to work with. It's just four-dimensional space. You rotate between the axes. This, complicated, okay? All right, so dispose down there. All right, so, any questions? Carry on. And I've got a sort of smorgasbord of topics to get through today, and probably starting on Tuesday, maybe, yeah, probably not getting to it today, but starting on Tuesday, we will begin a formal analysis of all of the elements of this special relativity story, defining things in such a way that when we go to general relativity on curved space, everything has a nice transition. So the very first thing we'll talk about is vectors. Like, what's a vector? I'm going to ask that question, what is a vector? And I'll answer it on Tuesday of next week. Okay? So again, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of ideas at you. Some of them might or might not be sticking. We're going to keep using them over and over again. So you know, if something doesn't stick, don't worry. You'll see it again on the board. OK. Now, what I want to talk about for the moment is what exactly is the set of transformations that we can do in special relativity? OK, so we know that the lambdas which satisfy this are the transformations we can do in special relativity, whereas the transformations which satisfy this are the set of rotations. So maybe if you're in three dimensions here and you're in four dimensions here, okay? Does anybody know what you would call the set of transformations R which satisfies that expression, the basically R transpose R equals the identity. The yeah. or three-dimensional orthogonal. Yeah, so this is what we call the orthogonal condition. So in three dimensions, we would call this O3. The word orthogonal means that if you transpose something and then multiply it by itself, you get the identity. This is what the word orthogonal means in terms of matrix multiplication. You know what orthogonal means in terms of vectors. Okay, so what about this? This kind of is like orthogonal, except the, the metric in here is definitely not the identity. Is there any takers? Okay, this we're just going to call the orthogonal group, the orthogonal set, but instead of putting it in four dimensions, I'm going to put it in one comma three dimensions. 
And this is a bit of notation which you're going to see pretty rampant. And that is, we are going to live in a one plus three dimensional space time. Which you might say, oh, that's four dimensional. But we write one plus three to remind ourselves that time has that special role in the metric. It's got the minus. In fact, as I just showed you earlier, you want to be careful between taking space and time or just four dimensions of space. Those are two entirely different things. So one plus three or one comma three, that's a nice way of reminding ourselves we live in four dimensions, but there's time, which has the negative part of the metric, and then there's the space, which I'll have positive. Okay, so this we can call O13, and it's just the set of lambdas which satisfy this, where eta is minus one, 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 one. Okay? Now, oh wait, crap, shoot, uh, hold on, so um, it turns out that in both of these stories, we can take these and we can break them up into two categories. The first category is the set, and I'll point at rotations because you're more familiar with rotations. The first category is the set of all rotations which can be continuously connected to the identity. Okay? The second set is something that satisfies this but cannot be continuously connected to the identity. So let me give you an example. X, Y, Z. And so these come out, these come out, and this is X, Y, Z. Okay, what kind of what kind of transformation did I just do? I did a rotation. This can be continuously connected to the identity because I can imagine taking this and very slowly just rotating it back continuously until I get doing nothing, okay? Now consider this. Everybody notice what I just did? I reflected the y-axis to this side. Can this be continuously connected to the identity? No. Okay? You, it could be a symmetry, however, we want to focus on the transformations which can be continuously connected to the identity for a couple of reasons. One, if we focus on these transformations, then we can actually establish the calculus applied to the transformations. You can talk about the derivative of a transformation if it's continuous. Taking the derivative of something that's discrete doesn't really matter, or doesn't make much sense. And this would eventually lead us to the notions of what are called Lie algebras. And this is a direction we go in to establish forces from gauge invariance and particle physics. Another thing is, is that if you're considering continuous transformations, continuous transformations give rise to cons conservation laws through Nether's theorem. They have to be continuous transformations rather than discrete ones, okay? So what we would like to do is we would like to take these both of these sets and get rid of all of the transformations which involve flipping an axis. And by the way, it's flipping an odd number of axes. Because if I take this coordinate system and I flip both the Z and the Y, that's actually a rotation. Everybody see that? So if you, if you flip an even number of axes, it's equivalent to a rotation. If you flip an odd number, then it's, it's discrete, okay? Now, here is the way that we get rid of it. First of all, let's just look at the determinant of this thing. All right? 
first of all. And these are just matrix determinants. So if you know what the matrix is, you should know what the answer is. Shaley. Shaley, what is the determinant of the metric? Determinant. So you're actually thinking more, you gave me the correct answer for what's the trace. Yeah, I want the determinant. Which I should say, you really gave me the correct answer to the trace, because if I ask most people what the trace of this is, they say two, which it's not, it's four. But anyway, so you're hyper correct to the wrong question. What's the depth, not the trunk? <laughs> what's the determinant of this? It's basically that you, you, you take this and you multiply it by the determinant of this. But to get the determinant of this, you take this and multiply it by the determinant. So it's just a negative, negative one. Yeah. OK? Now, Jared. Jared. Oh, boy. Yeah. Now, now, you don't have to do it. Just tell me, if I have the determinant of the product of three things, how is this related to the determinants of each of them? Yeah, it's just the product of the determinants. So this is the determinant of lambda transpose times the determinant of eta, which we just said is minus one, times the determinant of lambda. So minus one cancels minus one. Hey, how is the determinant of the transpose of a matrix related to the determinant of the matrix? What? They're the same. OK? Everybody follow that? The determinant of the transpose of a matrix is the same as the determinant of the matrix. So this actually says that det lambda squared is equal to 1. What is det lambda? Plus or minus 1. It's plus or minus 1. And by the way, det of r is also plus or minus 1. The same story plays out here. Okay? Now, interesting question. If I want the lambdas which are continuously connected to the identity, do you think I need the plus ones or the minus ones? Plus. Why? Because the determinant of the identity is one. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, the determinant of the identity is one. So if this is continuously, if I want the set that's continuously connected to the identity, it must include the identity. So by taking the set and only keeping the terms which have the determinant plus one, we have a set which is continuously connected to the identity, and that we call S O 1 comma 3. The S is often indicating special orthogonal, and we can also do S O 3. Now it's important because S O 3 is the group of rotations, not O 3. O3 includes those coordinate inversions, which are not equivalent to a rotation. Similarly, this corresponds to the set of transformations that we can do in special relativity, except it gets better than that because it turns out, it turns out that, and you'll prove this in your homework, if we consider a lambda, then the upper left highest term, the very first term in this matrix, we can call lambda 0, 0. OK, we all understand why it's 0 in a few minutes. This must satisfy, and there are reasons for this, that lambda 0, 0 squared itself is greater than or equal to 1. 
okay? If I want to be continuously connected to the identity, do I want this set or this set? I want the set on the right, okay? So in the end, we have as the set of transformations in special relativity, S, O, 1, comma, 3, up! Literally, that's, that's the symbolism. A little up arrow. This stands for the proper, proper meaning S, orthochronous, which corresponds to that, Lorentz group. And this is technically the group that we should use when we do special relativity. These are transformations which are continuously connected to the identity, they include rotations and boosts, and they satisfy this condition. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you think that's all of the symmetries of special relativity? No. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> no, nope, that's not all of them. Okay. Damn, we need more symmetries. Crap. Well, it turns out that the rest of the symmetries are actually quite intuitive. In fact, at some level, we've talked about them. These symmetries you can think of as rotations between all the axes. Okay? However, special relativity has an additional symmetry where I can consider what physics looks like from here. And from here, or from here, okay? What am I doing? Translating. I'm translating. Okay, what if I do an experiment right now, and then I do it right now? Should I get any different results? No. What did I do? Translate. I translated. So, in addition to these rotations, we can also translate in time x, y, or z. Okay? So altogether, the symmetry group of special relativity is called ISO1, 3 up. I'm trying to make sure nobody's asleep. Thank you. Thank you all. And this is. P4, which is the group of four translations, and it's a semi-direct product, and I won't even get into what a semi-direct product is, with SO1, 3, up! Okay? And this has four plus three plus three generators. And the word generator, don't worry about, that's fancy schmancy Lee algebra talk, but they're basically 10 distinct transformations you can do. Three rotations, three boosts, and then the four translations. Okay? Now, what I'm really interested in is the algebra. Of SO1, 3, up! Guys, I'll stop if you want me to. I'll be right. Okay, I won't do it anymore. Don't anyway, stop, <laughs> okay. Um, at any rate, uh, so with the algebra of transformations, Nick, Nick, 
Say it again. He's on the Zoom. Uh, is he there? Yeah, there you are, Nick. Yeah, you asked me? Yeah, so Nick, if I want to talk about the algebra of something, what do I need to calculate? Talk the algebra. The algebra of something. You calculate some rules for how they interact with each other? That's very, that's very good. But in physics, when we wanted to identify the algebra of say, operators in quantum mechanics, what quantity would we always calculate? Uh, I can't say, actually. You, you want to phone a friend? I might have to do that, yeah. Anybody want to help him? Are you referencing the quantum theory? Yes, I am. Nice. Exactly. We would be interested in referencing what is the commutator of two of the items. So for example, we can ask, what is the commutator of two rotations? What do you think? Should be zero. Should be zero? No. Nah. Generally, rotations don't commute. So in general, what would I expect if I do? So remember, this is taking R1, R2, and subtracting R2, R1. What does that have to give me? A new rotation. A new rotation, exactly. So the commutator of two rotations gives you a rotation. It's pretty straightforward. Equally straightforward is that the commutator of two boosts gives me a rotation. Ooh. OK, that's a bit wonky. What about the commutator of a boost and a rotation? Boost. Gives me a boost. Okay? So things get a little weird if we're moving straight away from just pure rotations into rotations and boosts. The algebra gets a little wonky. Okay? Now, uh, I'll skip the third comment and just go straight to the fourth. Uh, for S01, comma 3 up to be a symmetry, we need everything to transform <laughs> under it. Now, this can be written, these transformations can be written as just numbers, actually, if you're using the identity, the highly degenerate representation. But the fundamental representation, these are four by four matrices, and they act on four component vectors. So what this means is that in the story of special relativity, that will not do because this is a three component momentum. And the transformations, we're trying to make it symmetric under four components, or four by fours. So we have to replace every single vector that you're used to in three dimensional physics with a four component vector, which we will notate with the same symbol, but instead we'll give it this upper index mu. And I'll talk about, I'll talk about mu in a minute. Okay? T, T, T is what we use to parameterize the motion of things, right? You know, velocity is a function of time. T, hmm, is T a scalar under this? I mean, T, T plays a role in this, right, because there's C D T, delta X, delta Y, delta Z, in the coordinate differential. So how does T transform under these transformations? Does it transform like a scalar? Or does it transform like the component of a vector? It transforms like the component of a vector. That is not an object which is nicely transforming. Tra objects which transform nicely under this are scalars or vectors or higher order things, which we'll talk about next time. 
So T is a bit of a problem. And what we will end up doing is replacing T by something we call tau, which I will give a very concrete definition to later, okay? But the idea is that pretty much everything that you do in physics in three dimensions has to be four-dimensionalized, everything, okay? All right. So, <clears throat> what we're going to do now, and again, I'm throwing kind of a collection of stuff, which is not necessarily intimately connected, but it eventually will all be. We are going to talk a bit about Lorentz transformations and space-time diagrams. worked with space-time diagrams when you learned special relativity in modern physics? Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay, well, by all means, tell me if you've seen everything I'm about to show you when I'm done, okay? Here we go. I'm gonna start with a rotation, and then we'll go to special relativity because rotations are more familiar. What I wanna do is I want to consider a rotation of my coordinate system by an angle phi into the new coordinate system. Okay. Let me begin by describing this. So first of all, we can take, this is an R2. We can take a point labeled by x and y, and we can say, okay, under the rotation, this gets new coordinates, x prime and y prime, which are cosine of phi, sine of phi, minus sine of phi, or cosine of phi, times what I started with. And of course, if I do the matrix multiplication, this gives me cosine of phi x plus sine of phi y minus sine of phi x plus cosine of phi y, okay? So that's what I end up getting. And most often what we actually would say is that, okay, never mind this, this is crap. The new x prime is that and the new y prime is that. It's a better way of saying it, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to draw this again, but more carefully. So, I'm going to start with the y-axis and the x-axis, and then I want to use these relationships in order to draw the new x prime and y prime axis. This is gonna seem silly until I apply it, okay? So just bear with me on this example. So first of all, the x prime axis is where y prime equals zero, right? When I'm at y prime equals zero, I'm on the x prime axis. Well, I can take this expression and say, okay, minus sine phi of x plus cosine phi of y is equal to zero. <laughs> Therefore, y is sine phi, oh, it's tangent, tangent of phi. Times x. Okay? And so if I come over here and I draw this line, this line is going to be like this. Of course, that's the x prime axis. Everybody on board? And then more quickly, y prime axis is uh, where x prime equals zero. 
So setting x prime equal to zero, cosine phi x plus sine phi y equals zero. Now this is going to be y equals minus cotangent of phi times x. Oh, yeah, and if I plot that, I get that line. Where, if you worked out the trigonometry underlying it, these angles are five. We on board? Notice the slopes of these two lines multiply together to give you minus one, which is what you expect for the slopes of two perpendicular lines. Everything's cool, right? Good. Now, we get to apply this to a less familiar case. I am going to consider x and ct. This is a case of what we might call two-dimensional Minkowski space. Or you could just say I'm just drawing one plane in M4. It doesn't matter. OK? Now here's my question. If I start with that coordinate system and I do a boost, that's a transformation in the xt plane, what does the new coordinate system look like? answers, I'm actually going to derive it, but I saw a couple of correct answers back there, okay? So let's derive it. First of all, I don't want to just picture it like this, I want to follow this procedure, okay? So we know that a boost takes ctx to ct, and I'll just do this the cleaner way, to ct prime x prime where ct prime we can write as ct hash phi minus x sinh phi. And I'm using the hash and the sinh versions of this transformation just because this is an easier story to tell. Minus ct sinh phi plus x hash phi. Okay? And this is using as my lambda matrix the matrix that corresponded to a a boost, minus cos phi, such, minus sinh phi, minus sinh phi, cos phi. Okay? So now we can play the same game. We can say the CT prime axis, so the new version of this axis is when x prime equals zero, but this, of course, is minus ct sinh phi plus x cos phi, which immediately tells me that ct is equal to the hyperbolic cotangent times x. Okay? And then the x prime axis is when ct prime equals zero which of course is ct cos phi minus x sinh phi, which tells me that ct is the hyperbolic tangent times x. Hold on a minute. Those are both positively sloped. So quick question. Yeah. It is, is this telling you the slope? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Oh, is it? Okay. It definitely is. And that's the observation I just made. Both of these slopes are positive. In fact, if we draw these on the old coordinates, what we find is that x becomes this and ct becomes this. So some like to call this the scissoring of the axes. All right. Now, there is 
a special value to which you could limit, all right, and this corresponds to a particular value of phi, but it is the one where the slope of both of these are the same, okay? And that, of course, would be the axis straight up the middle. And this is the axis where CT is equal to X. And that is, of course, moving at the speed of light. So what we're doing is we're starting out with this picture XCT, and we're boosting to a faster or to a different frame of motion. In this case, we're taking a positive velocity. It's scissoring the axes, and if we limited that to boosting to the speed of light, these axes would actually come together, which is weird. Things get weirder. Don't worry about that. Okay? But here is the first question I want to ask. If I have CT and X, and then I have a new X prime, and a new CT prime, what does a line of constant CT prime look like? No hyperbola? Nope. It's a good guess, though. So a line of constant CT prime. Hmm. I mean, it could be zero, in which case it's this axis. Right? I mean, that's, that's what we used here. Or sorry, sorry, that's what we used here. We said if CT prime was zero, then we're just moving along the X prime axis. But what if CT is positive? Would it just be parallel to the It would be parallel, exactly. We could just take CT prime to be some number K, in which case CT comes out to be tangent chi plus K. So what I want to point out is there were, two op there were two options. One was you could imagine lines which are perpendicular to the CT prime axis, but those are not constant time lines. They're not constant T prime lines. Constant T prime lines are lines which are parallel to X prime. This is going to be very important in the following observation. Sorry, can I only ask you, are you using the word constant? Why am I using the word constant? Yeah. Because in a given coordinate system, so in, this, in the, the, the coordinate system described by the prime coordinates, we can say the instant of time t equals two seconds. And then we can, we can ask what are the spatial positions associated with that time. I mean, in four dimensions, right, you, you can move through four dimensions and move in time and in space. But we're saying, if I want to be at an instant of time and then ask what's the spatial geometry look like, it looks like this, okay? All right. Alex, I have a question. Yeah. Really two very similar questions. Um, is that supposed to be a tangent x or a tangent t prime of x in your CT equals t? Uh, in this expression? Um, no, yeah, you're right, 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 you're right. This is, yeah, sorry, this is supposed to be cosh. Cosh of x or cosh of t times x? Oh, sorry. Oh my god. Yeah, I was just making this shit up. I didn't look at my notes. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry about that. So it's supposed to be CT prime is CT cosh phi plus a constant. My apologies. Okay. Okay. So now I want to point out an issue that arises with this fact that 
time is slanted. And this will lead us, of course, into one of the primary discussions of what has to be completely overhauled when you move from Galilean relativity to special relativity. So first of all, oh man, I just erased this and I'm going to redraw it. Shoot. Okay, fine. I'm getting really good at drawing it over and over and over again. Okay. Imagine the two events, A, and I'll separate them even more to make this obvious. The events A and B. Yeah, okay. Are you ready? How much time takes place between these events in the TX reference frame? Zero, because that's a line of constant time. So in the primed coordinate system, it should also be zero, right? No, because in the prime coordinate system, lines of constant time, for example, one that goes through the point B, are parallel to the x-axis. So to the observer in the non-primed coordinates, these two events are simultaneous. But to an observer which is moving and experiencing things in the primed coordinate system, this is just a boosted observer, someone in motion with respect to the original reference frame. The boosted observer sees B happen before A. Okay? Make sense? Remember, when I said one of the primary differences between Galilean relativity and special relativity is Galilean relativity says, okay, you're four-dimensional space-time, but time is absolute. Whereas special relativity said, I don't know about time, but the speed of light is constant to all observers. What we just found was that in a theory where the speed of light is the same to all observers, which, was, which is what leads to this, time is not absolute. Okay? I can do an experiment, and I can get one result in one reference frame for the amount of time it takes to do something, and I can get a different answer if I'm doing the experiment in motion. Okay? Now, this is super important because the absoluteness of time is a key, a essential ingredient in our notion of causality. Causality is the idea that A causes B. If A causes B, can B cause A? No. Now, I want you to go to the Galilean lifestyle. It's where you all live most of the time. Okay? Can you give me a restriction on the timing of A with respect to the timing of B such that a causes B. What can you say? A has to be before B. Exactly. A has to be before B for A to cause B. Well, hold on. In one reference frame, B comes before A, so B can cause A, but in the other reference frame, A and B happen at the exact same instant. And in yet another reference frame, A comes before B. Does 
That clearly doesn't work in special relativity. So this absoluteness of time is the bedrock of our notion of causality in Newtonian or Galilean physics. This will not work for us in special relativity. We need something else. Yes? Can we cause A? Can, can what? Can we cause A in this? In, in this case? Yes, in a CP prime case? Uh, well, no, because the thing is, the thing is, but I have to so, so, so this is actually an extreme example because I could also change coordinates such that A happens before B. So there's, there's three different coordinate systems, one in which B happens before A, one in which they happen at the same time, and another one in which A happens before B. So now here's the thing. Forget about coordinates for a minute. Let's say that, I'm sorry, I, this, this example always comes to mind, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but if, 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 if B is your parents getting together and A is them having you, that had to happen before this, right? Yeah. And I don't care what coordinate system you use, you have to agree on that. That's a cause and effect. So just saying that something happened before in time is not gonna work in special relativity because you can reverse the order of some things in time. I guess the better question would be is can A still be causal even if it happened after B? Well, so I'm about to specify what exactly we need to say when we talk about happening after, because there's actually a, there's a limit to it. Okay, so I'm going to answer your question in full in just a moment. It's just, it's no, there's no simple universal clock where you can say, well, this happened in two seconds and this happened in five seconds, therefore this can cause this. That's not the simple resolution. Here's the resolution, okay? Here we go. First and foremost, for two things to be caused or related by causation, signals have to be able to go from the cause to the effect, right? I mean, you know, if I'm gonna stand here and you're gonna stand there next to the light switch and I'm gonna clap and then you're gonna flip the switch when you hear my clap, there's a finite speed at which that information is conveyed. What is it? It's the speed of light, or the speed of masslessness. Well, I mean, you could watch me, in which case it's light. Yeah, sorry, I, I shouldn't have used clapping. I should have used, like, dancing for you to swap, swap off the light, okay? So, speed is the important limitation on cause. So let me just show you the resolution here and then I'll take questions on it because I think giving you the resolution will make more sense than the problem I'm setting up once you see it. So, suppose there is an event A, okay? And this event happens In Minkowski space, okay, special relativity is its invariance. I would like to know what events can A influence? What events can A cause? First and foremost, can A cause, well, actually, let me give you a, a an easier one, can A cause D? No, no way, okay? Can A cause C? Sure. Can A cause B? Okay, so for those of you who are getting these right, what you're constructing in your head is the path of light moving out from the event A. So I should specify what we talk about when we're talking about these, these things influencing other things is we're talking about events. An event is a specific point in space and time. Okay, so that was an event. Has coordinates, has a coordinate value in T, coordinate value in X, coordinate value in Y and Z, okay? So when you have an event, 
The fastest that it can influence anything is for light propagating from it. It could also affect things slower. It could be a sound thing. But the fastest it can possibly do is the speed of light. So the things that this can influence are anything within this area. Of course, if we want to include a second spatial direction, then this forms a cone. And now we have what is called the forward light cone of A. That is, if you have an event in space-time, that event defines a light cone going forward. And this event can influence anything which happens to lie inside of this light cone. Yes? So just to clarify, A has the light cone and can't influence B because he does have the light cone. But B has this different light cone and A is also, it's not in the light cone, but you can look at it relative to B. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Now, um, there's another light cone. <laughs> we can ask, what events could influence A? Can B influence A? No. no. It turns out that to figure out what can influence A, we build the backwards light cone. So any event breaks space-time into three regions. There is the forward light cone, which is comprised of everything that this can influence. There is the past light cone, which is everything that could have influenced this. And then there is the exterior. The exterior is causally disconnected. It can't have anything to do with A. It can't cause it. It can't be caused by it. OK? Was there a causally disconnected region in Galilean space-time? Nope. In Galilean space-time, you just said, well, if you happen after me, then I can cause you. If you happen before me, then you can cause me. And if you happen at the exact same time with me, we can cause each other. But there's no region that's causally disconnected in Galilean relativity. In special relativity, you'll notice it's most of space time. OK? Now, this is the light cone structure for event A. The light cone structure for event B? Well, again, we just shoot out light cones. B cause B? No. Can B cause C? No. Yes? So what's your find the angle? So it's, okay, so basically um, it's when delta x over C delta t uh, yeah, equals, well, no, it's when delta x over delta t equals c, which we're going to, in many instances, take to be 1. So in these pictures, where I'm referring to the light cone as moving up the 45 degree angle, okay, that's assuming that c is equal to 1. Otherwise, we could just draw it with, you know, 3 times 10 to the a meters per second. But I don't want to do that. Okay? So for, for something from A to get outside of its light cone, it has to travel faster than the speed of light. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but for something to get from A to inside of its light cone, it just has to travel at most the speed of light. It can also travel at rest. OK? What if, what if we can advance in between both light cones? 
So what if there's an event here? Yeah. Which, which one would cause what? Would they both cause that? They could both cause it. Yes. So you'll get to play with some of this in the homework. Okay? But this is the important thing. The notion of causality, in a sense, is way more complicated than it was in Galilean relativity, where you just said, if it happens before, it can cause it. And this is important, because we're doing physics. We're doing cause and effect, OK? Of course, we're talking about the continuous flow of time. And so we're talking about you know, things at an earlier time, which are influencing things at a later time, not really just you know, things here versus things here. It's continuous, but nonetheless, like. How do you define the continuous flow of time and, well, and cause, well, that's the thing. You have to split these things up. With Minkowski or, Gal or sorry, with Galilean relativity, you can, you can immediately replace causality with the flow of time. Whereas in special relativity, you have time, but causality is not just time. Causality is more akin to looking at the light cone. Okay, yes? Is there a difference between like on the edge of the light cone or is it still just a general light cone? Yeah, no, so being on the edge is basically um, the anywhere along the edge of the light cone is the path that light is taking from the event A. Okay. So if, if I, you know, if I, if I explode, I put out light and I put out sound, okay? The light is all traveling at the speed C, so the light from my explosion is all along the edge of this. The sound is somewhere in the middle, because sound travels slower than speed of light. Other questions? Feel free to, I mean, I'm actually done today. I'm done a little bit early, because I'm not going to move into our next topic until we meet on Tuesday. So if there are any more questions, yes? Sorry, say it one more time. Um, like for these light cones on the edge of still it's still light, if it happens in these, like does that react to the equation? No, okay. no, no. Yeah, so in fact, you should kind of in a certain sense forget about these axes when you're talking about causality. You should draw light cones. Okay? In Galilean relativity, you could draw a t-axis and you could look at it and say, oh, this causes that. The t-axis isn't going to do you any good. The t-axis can change. So really what you need to focus on are the light cones associated with events in terms of their causal structure. Okay? All right. I will see you all next Tuesday. Please go ahead and get started with the homework. I will hold office hours next Wednesday and next Thursday as promised. I'll put those on the website. My, my, my TA Madison is also going to hold office hours. I'm going to find out from her tomorrow when those are going to be and add those to the website as well. Yes, sir. Do you want me to stop with that? Yeah, you stop. So